How wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to discuss some of the more unusual and really unexpected discoveries in regards to the massive geomagnetic storm that happened in 2024. And that's because on May 2024, our planet experienced the most powerful storm in over two decades. The event commonly referred to as the Mother's Day Storm, or more officially, Ganon Storm. Technically, Ganon Superstorm. And this was an extremely rare event and was definitely unexpected. And as we discussed last year, it produced some of the most incredible aurora, even in regions that have not seen aurora for a very long time. Here's an image from NASA showing us where these aurora were visible. But for scientists, this wasn't just beautiful, this was an important test of our technology, just to see if anything actually breaks. But also, it gave us unprecedented direct measurements of the phenomena that were previously only theorized. And so today we're going to discuss some of the new facts discovered about the storm, and specifically some of the really bizarre effects space weather has on planet Earth that has not been officially measured and detected. But to understand this event, we have to first understand the Sun, and specifically understand solar storms, all of which usually start very close to sunspots. And sunspots are always regions of extremely strong magnetic forces, somewhere on the solar surface, that usually produce one of two major events, either solar flares, or coronal mass ejections. Now, solar flares happen quite a lot, and these are essentially large eruptions of electromagnetic radiation, or basically light, that can then travel toward our planet and very often cause immediate radio blackouts. And while well, something like this did happen during this period. As you can see here, on May 20th, one of the most powerful solar flares in the last few decades was also observed. But more crucially, there's also something referred to as coronal mass ejections. These are usually gigantic clouds of plasma and strong magnetic fields ejected from the sun. And coronal mass ejections, or CMEs, are the primary cause of geomagnetic storms on the planet. And so here, this Ganon storm, or Ganon superstorm, was essentially one of these CMEs and originated around a very specific sunspot. The sunspot you see right here referred to as AR3664, a region that was about 17 times larger than planet Earth and that between May 8th and May 11th launched at least 8 different CMEs toward the planet. And it also produced one of the largest flares during this time, which caused the radio blackout as well. But unlike the flare, in this case, CMEs took a few days to reach us. And so by May 10th and May 11th, it essentially resulted in a G5-class geomagnetic storm on the surface of the planet. And this was the first G5 alert issued in the last 20 years. But I guess the question is, how strong was this, and how does it actually compare to historical values? Well, in this case, the storm's intensity is usually measured using something referred to as DST, or Disturbance Storm Time Index. And though the initial value for this was minus 412 nanotesla, it has now been confirmed to be approximately minus 518 nanotesla, making this one of the strongest storms to affect Earth since 1989. But actually, one of the strongest storms in the last two centuries as well but it was not as powerful as the famous Carrington event. The DST for Carrington is anywhere between minus 800 and minus 1700. Likewise, the 1921 storm was probably around minus 900 as well, whereas the 2003 Halloween storm was a little bit weaker at minus 400. And that, of course, makes this a historical event, which is why it was able to produce so many aurora. This was, of course, caused by a lot of charged particles being channeled by the Earth's compressed magnetic field, with these particles then striking various atoms in the atmosphere and resulting in different types of fluorescence. You can learn more about the exact colors and what produced them in one of the previous videos in the description. And the sightings from this event were visible almost everywhere. For example, in North America, the lights were seen as far south as Florida Keys and Yucatan Peninsula, and even Jamaica. Whereas in Europe, even Spain, Portugal, and Turkey could see the lights as well. And because of this widespread documentation and quite a lot of photographs, researchers now had a lot of data to work with. And specifically because a lot of modern cameras on various smartphones are actually sensitive enough to pick up very specific colors in these aurora that then allow researchers to work out exactly what produced the aurora and how much energy was deposited from outer space. But some of the most critical and some of the most important observations came from satellites. And more this recent study is actually based on the observations from JAXA's ARASI satellite, that studied the plasmosphere of the planet during this period. In this case, plasmosphere is a protective layer of cold charged particles encircling the planet that usually works with the magnetic field to protect us from harmful particles. 
And so during the storm, this particular satellite was positioned in just the right way to measure the Earth's plasmosphere during this event. And it made quite a shocking discovery. The discovery that was recently reported in this study. Turns out during this time there was an extreme compression of plasmosphere, with the outer boundary that's usually around 44,000 kilometers away from the planet suddenly being violently pushed toward the planet and basically becoming compressed as you're about to see in this video. Within just 9 hours, the boundary was compressed to just 9,600 kilometers or basically being shrunk by about 5 times. And so suddenly plasmosphere became just one-fifth of its normal size. And so this rapid deep shrinkage was actually similar to what models suggested should occur and what possibly happened during the 2003 storms as well. But this was the first official observation and the first official evidence that this is indeed what happens in reality. But the second discovery was more surprising and did not match the models. Here this also involved very slow recovery. Normally after the geomagnetic storm, particles coming from ionosphere refill the plasmosphere in approximately one or maybe two days. So the whole plasmosphere returns to its original size pretty quickly and continues to defend our planet. But after Ganon superstorm, plasmosphere seems to have taken at least four days and actually up to five days to return to its original size. And this was the longest recovery period that's been observed since 2017 and currently does not make sense. Although here scientists believe it might have been the result of a phenomenon referred to as the negative storm, when the massive amount of energies coming from the sun cause intense heating in the upper atmosphere near the poles that then changes the atmospheric chemistry around these regions and causes a shift in charged particles inside the ionosphere. And since ionosphere is required to refill the plasmosphere, this basically cuts off the supply of particles, delaying the recovery significantly. But right now this is just a suggestion and just a model, and there are no real explanations yet. Here though, understanding what happened is important, because today this affects a lot of space satellites, and they were essentially completely unprotected for at least 4 days. Additionally, we also have a discovery from a different layer around the planet, referred to as the E-layer, or sporadic E-layer, as it's sometimes also known as. This is about 90 to 120 kilometers above the sea level, and it's a layer made out of thin, dense patches of ionized metal particles that are usually produced by various types of space dust and asteroids entering Earth's atmosphere every single day. And while previously it was believed that this layer should not be affected by any solar storms. But that seems to be not the case. Scientists discovered that this layer, and specifically E clouds, intensified dramatically during the recovery phase of Ganon Superstorm. Moreover, a lot of these dense clouds traveled from the polar regions down to the lower latitudes and migrated across the planet, which has not been seen before. This was possibly caused by some kind of a large atmospheric wave that was triggered by the storm. And so here the layer that was believed to be more or less constant and never really changing was actually shifted by the storm as well. And though this doesn't affect us on the surface, it does affect radio technology. And so sporadic e-layers are known to disrupt radio communication and specifically high frequency bands. And so this is something that we definitely need to know about because a lot of modern technology depends on this type of communication and many different signals pass through this layer all the time. As a matter of fact, the main reason for the SpaceX Starlink internet disruption during this time was because of the shift in this e-layer that affected satellite internet. But on the other hand, what was surprising here is that, apart from these individual issues for some companies such as SpaceX, this storm did not cause worldwide widespread damage. Which scientists believe might be the result of improved modern infrastructure based on the experience from 1989 storm that completely knocked out my home province of Quebec. And so the experience from Canadian power companies potentially served as a needed resource in order to improve modern technology and to basically make it prepared for most types of powerful geomagnetic storms. Nevertheless, this storm definitely stressed the technology quite significantly. Most of the satellites and GPS services did actually experience service degradation, and even satellites like Gaia, which are pretty far away from Earth, experienced electrical problems with some of the satellites used by NASA, for example, even shining down completely for at least several hours. Although here, one of the more bizarre impacts was on agriculture, and that's because today many farmers use GPS equipment on different agricultural products in order to improve the efficiency of harvest. But a lot of tractors, such as the John Deere RTK GPS equipment, could not function properly during this time, 
and resulted in suspended planting activity, causing at least some damage to certain farmers. Obviously, this was not super damaging, but it still shows us how dependent we've actually become on space technology, and how it really only takes one geomagnetic storm to completely disrupt our livelihoods and cause unexpected financial damage. But honestly, at least for now, we kind of got lucky. This particular storm right now just served as a kind of a crucial reality check, and basically confirmed that space weather can indeed disrupt a lot of technologies we use today, and can do so without any announcements. And so here, once again, this was not just some kind of a beautiful light show, this was a powerful reminder that our planet depends on this very powerful shield that it naturally produces, but also that this shield, when basically broken, can actually take some time to repair if chemistry in the atmosphere is affected, preventing new particles from forming in order to refill the plasma sphere. And so there's still quite a lot to measure, quite a lot to understand, and quite a lot to learn about. Which means that we'll probably come back and discuss this more in some of the future videos once there is some additional research, or once maybe another geomagnetic storm hits our planet and we can actually see some additional effects. Until then, check out previous videos in the description. Thank you for watching, subscribe, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support the channel on Patreon where you can find additional videos, videos without any ads and can DM it directly, or by joining your channel membership that grants you early access. You can also buy the wonderful person t-shirt in the description below. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.